Hey guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks focused on the future and making it more awesome. And today we have someone who's gotten to infinity, or going to infinity and beyond, so to speak. Franz von der Dunk on the program. Franz, thanks for coming. Sure, my pleasure. Space law, what's the deal? How did we get here? And that seems so opaque. Where, where are we at, where are we headed, and how did you become a space lawyer? That's a lot of uh, valid questions put in one, and it's obviously a question that I often encounter because not many people are aware that something like space law exists. But, but basically, I'm always, always reminded of a, uh, of a headline in the New York Times 10 years ago, which read that wherever you go, the tax man goes. And, and the same applies for the lawyer and the lawyer, right? So as soon as humans start to become active in outer space, which, which effectively started in 1957 when Sputnik was launched, the discussion on what the uh, legal ramifications of that flight were. Are you allowed to, to, to make flights like that? What are the conditions? Who has a say in that? Etc. Etc. And as to my career, I wasn't even born in 57, I, I can uh, honestly say right now. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, of course, space law developed over time. When it started out in, in the early 60s, it was basically a matter of bilateral agreements between the United States and the Soviet Union, at that time the two superpowers in, in space. And it was done by a handful of treaties. And there was, you know, to put it a little bit in black and white terms, there was not much else at the time. But as space became opened up to more and more countries, including smaller countries and third world countries, and of course also to private enterprise, uh, which in the 70s and 80s started to see the benefits of space for commercial satellite communication purposes, then of course that raised all sorts of new legal issues and the need to discuss the, them and to create laws. And I sort of rolled into that almost accidentally because when I was uh, working at the Leiden University back in the late 1980s in the Department on General Public International Law, of which space was kind of a small subset certainly at the time, it just seemed like a, like a fun, easy, special specialization and niche to, to delve into. So that's what I did. And then, of course, over the 30 plus years that I've been working on it, it has been grown in volume and size and scope, and it continues to be great fun. Great fun and great adventure, but yet great peril as well. So you, you go from the very early days, not the early, early days of space, but pretty, pretty early in terms of when people were really starting to become active to today. What has changed in your perspective from the legal side of things and what has been dinosaurishly slow to catch up? <laughs> well, to start with the latter, treaties are by definition uh, slow, in particular if they are recognized and ratified by almost all states of the world, at least those who matter, which is the case with the Outer Space Treaty, the most fundamental treaty going back to 1967. Because obviously the more parties you have to a treaty, the more you need basically all those parties on board to then change the treaty. So um, it, it's sort of the backside of a very successful treaty that to change it requires to get more people on board, which in today's fragmented international society becomes harder and harder. And indeed, the Outer Space Treaty has, um, has problems in certain respects of coping with the new developments and the most crucial and fundamental one is, is one that I touched upon just before, and that's the involvement of private, uh, private enterprise, private, the private sector in space activities. Back in the 60s, when this treaty and a few other important treaties were concluded, it was just about states and then actually only a handful of states, which also meant that those states were held responsible and liable for whatever any future private uh, actor in space might do. And that still, legally speaking, is still the case today. And that leads to a very peculiar situation because imagine Boeing launching something from, um, from Cape Canaveral and it crashes into Mexico City. Uh, the normal legal consequence would be that the victims in Mexico would try to sue Boeing for damages in the United States, for example, or probably in Mexico, but I assume they would go to the United States because usually the courts are more generous there in, in, uh, in, in allowing for compensation for damage. But in a private capacity, 
However, what happens as a consequence of the way that space law developed in the 1960s is that it's not actually the individual victims which need to sue Boeing, it's Mexico which has, to go, which has the right to go to the United States government and say this is about a private uh, company with US nationality launching from the United States. You as a country are liable for all the damage caused in Mexico and, and you are liable more so without a limit. So it is then up to the United States to try to somehow get back to Boeing in order to make sure that Boeing, at least to a certain extent, reimburses the United States for what the United States has to pay to Mexico. Um, and that is a pretty unique situation. And of course, many people are not very happy with that because it, it, it complicates the issue. It means that uh, the Mexican victims need the Mexican state, in my example, to uh, actually make a case against uh, the United States. And there are all sorts of other issues, but it, going back to your original question, this whole idea of private involvement in actual space activities, because of the structure of international space law, required states to pick up the baton to develop national systems of licensing and regulating the space flight because it would be the states which would be held internationally responsible and liable for anything those space activities did wrong or caused damage, etc., etc. It would be like if GM manufactures a car, I buy that car and drive it into someone's house, and then the homeowner sues GM. It's a little bit convoluted in terms of how it works. Right. Actually, uh, yeah, it is. Although it has its benefits, I should say. But it, for, for, it, is, it, is not, it doesn't make sense from a logical perspective. And that's why you do some people today and, and over the last decades, actually, see and try to change that and say we should get rid of those treaties and create a new regime. What would be better if I gave you a magic wand? Um, I'm not even sure that that would be a better one. Um, because one of the beauties of this system is that uh, actually the victims uh, have a better certainty, a better degree of certainty that if something bad happens, that they will be compensated because the states are the most, the deepest pockets of all. And the risk that a state allows a space activity to take place under its jurisdiction, under its flag, just because it, you know, it gets some money with it and to hell with all the consequences, which if, if you are aware of what happens in the maritime sector with flags of convenience, that risk is not very, it's not, it's not nearly as large in our space. In, in, in maritime sector, you know the countries, I don't know that, I, I'm not going to mention their names, but everyone knows them. There are a couple of countries who allow you to carry their flag on your oil tanker regardless of the safety measures or the, you know, the training of the captain and the crew and, and all sorts of things. And if somebody goes wrong, which it regularly does, you have these horrific environmental accidents or, or other accidents, um, it, is, uh, it is usually the consequence of very lightweight regulation by flags of countries who are just, you know, happy to generate some cash from the licensing and don't care about the international responsibilities. And because in those cases, you still have to sue the tank owners or the operators instead, the tanker operators instead of the country, uh, it is much more difficult for victims to, to, to get the damage compensated. So in that sense, going to a state means that the state will feel responsible and many countries actually have these national laws, which sort of duly monitor and, and, and verify that private operators are indeed operating in safe mode, have the appropriate insurances, etc., etc. So I'm not even sure I want to uh, get rid of that system. It does, however, uh, require some more profound international agreement if we really want to make it work for, for private enterprise, because um, if a private entity is confronted with different licensing, with fundamentally different licensing obligations all over the world, because each country imposes their own idiosyncratic um, uh, uh, sets of obligations, then that is not very good for a private enterprise, and I think for the world at large. But it's rather that I would tinker with the system or, or adapt it, than do away with it and scratch, uh, start from scratch. Do you think there's an analogy to be had with 100-ish plus years ago and 
the piracy that we saw. Most of that was actually state sponsored. Hey, you can have the ship and everything's all good and well, as long as you're stealing from our enemies and not from us, then we'll kind of let it go yeah. under the table. We'll, you, we'll take our 20% and we'll all be good. <laughs> yeah, well, luckily, at least in that sense, the world has moved on. Um, and and uh, much as piracy became obviously completely outlawed, it was considered one of the original crimes against humanity, if you will, which, which every state has not only the right, but actually the obligation to combat, regardless of whether its own, you know, um, nationals or companies are involved on either side, both as actors or as victims, they are supposed to take measures to combat that. And even though it hasn't unfortunately weeded out piracy, uh, it, it has become fairly limited. But the baseline is that it's completely prohibited and that we have been able to include in outer space as well. So from the legal perspective, I think the chances are, are, are minimal. But that, of course, leaves the question open, what if a bad guy who is really big uh, uses this and simply gets away with it because there are no appropriate mechanisms in the international community to punish or sanction those, 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 those activities? And you may think, uh, you know, in, in space, for example, that's the, that's the claims that the Russians are currently making somewhat subvertently that all this private American enterprise in outer space is just a disguised tool of the U.S. government to again impose U.S. domination on space. I mean, this whole Cold War rhetoric is coming back. So from their perspective, they see what these private companies might soon be doing in terms of space mining or space resource utilization or, or, or even space flights or settlements on Mars and the moon as a disguised way of, if you will, piracy. Uh, legally speaking, it doesn't fly. I don't think the political argument flies as well, but the argument is made. And, you know, to, to view the other side of the fence, you see that the Russians are doing similar aggressive things when it comes to the North Pole, uh, where they plant a flag on, underneath the, uh, or, or in the, on, the, on the ocean floor at the North Pole to basically stake their claims and say, this is ours. That is a way of state piracy if you will as well is this this is ours concept too outdated to apply to space for instance do we want to play the whole colonialism game or do you see what do you see as the future for states in space as space becomes a place that we more and more work in and potentially in the future live in yeah yeah well let me again start with the legal uh, with the legal uh, you know point of departure because obviously that's my trade uh, legally speaking, colonization is outlawed. Uh, already on Earth with the UN Charter, we are, have generally come to the conclusion that uh, colonization in the sense of basically in history, it used to be Western European countries like my own country, the Netherlands, who went to other parts of the world, planted their flag there and said, this is now our subject to our sovereignty and we are entitled to do with it what we want. Now, since the Second World War, this is no longer uh, allowed in international law and of course we've seen a whole process of decolonization interestingly both the united states and the soviet union when they concluded this 1967 outer space treaty were also of the opinion that this should never be happening in outer space and that's why a fundamental article of the outer space treaty actually precludes any exercise of territorial sovereignty which is of course the legal term for trying to colonize uh, another part of this cosmos uh, that was completely outlaw. And, and for example, the Americans made very clear that when they planted the U.S. flag on the moon um, uh, with the Apollo landings, this did not in any way reflect what two, three centuries before the Dutch and the Spanish and the English had done with their flags elsewhere. So they were very keen on making the point, this doesn't mean that the moon is now supposed to be or claimed to be U.S. territory, anything like that. So in that sense, legal colonization is out of the question. Now, the term colonization, that's part of the problem and of the confusion in this discussion, in a practical sense, in the sense of uh, creating establishments there for humans to live on a permanent basis, that type of colonization is perfectly allowed because the Outer Space Treaty does also allow for settlements uh, etc., etc., as long as they don't uh, 
uh, morph into actual external parts of the state. So in, in, in legal terms, you have to continue to see them not as an outlying part of the territory of the motherland, because that would be colonization in the wrong sense of the word, but as a ship which is permanently anchored somewhere, and because of the flag of the ship, still is subject to the ruling of the motherland. That's the comparison, and I, I know it's a fine granular borderline, which is often difficult to understand for those who have not worked with these legal concepts for many years, but it is a crucial understanding. And it means that anyone who says that, you know, one state can claim the moon in law is prohibited. But unfortunately, that's of course not the end of the, uh, the, the problem. Um, once you start actually inhabiting and settling, certainly if those per settlements become quasi-permanent, you might have the mother country saying, well, you know, we don't call it an outlying province, but we simply act like it's one because these are our spaceships which landed there and which have been, uh, you know, uh, extended to become fully autonomous habitats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. At what point that would then still be have to be seen as a violation of the prohibition on colonization is still an open question. I mean, if you just settle there for a few months, clearly not. If you settle there for a few years. I would still say not, but if you have settled there for 150 years, cannot other states validly start to claim, well, sorry guys, but you are now acting as, this, as if this is your territory forever. You know what I'm saying? So there is, this discussion is, is taking place. Now, nope. yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, it sounds like there'll be a move your feet, lose your seat type argument eventually where you want to send your yeah. probe scouts, et cetera, to steal all of the good seats and then if anyone can, along sure i can right. uh, i can sell you this on ticketmaster but it's going to cost you 5x right right but to to uh, in the long run if you know if, if these things happen which they many people believe are going is, is going to start soon you get another issue interfering with that and that is of course that if you really have people permanently living there um, at some point in time they have to do that on a self-sustaining basis it, it is not it doesn't work if, if, if much of the stuff that, that they need to live there, and, and that goes down to things as, as air and water and as simple as that and food, if you each time have to skip all that, ship all that from the earth to the moon or Mars. So you have to quickly develop into a self-sustainable environment. Now, what happens if a group of people having lived for maybe 20 years on a celestial body, have been able to sustain themselves, have probably even been procreated themselves and, 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 and given rise to babies born there who've never seen the earth, who probably might never go back, no, go back to the earth or go to the earth in the first place. Um, what you then may see interfering is this, what we've seen happening in history, actually at the very origin of the United States, that these, let's still call them colonists, for want of a better word, start to feel no longer part uh, you know, emotionally, psychologically, and then also legally, of their motherland. They say, well, uh, you know, like the Pilgrim Fathers in, in uh, North American territories, they, uh, after some decades, they said, well, we don't care about the British king. He has no clue what it means to live in these foreign and enemy lands. He just taxes us. He doesn't defend us. Uh, his system is old-fashioned anyway, so we no longer feel we are subjects of the King of Great Britain, which means that we established our own nation, which then, of course, soon became the United States. That type of discussion will, I'm pretty sure, arise on these celestial settlements as soon as, uh, as, as they will be there for, as I said, a couple of decades, which gives the question a whole different thing, right? And, and, and then to make, again, the historical comparison, will we see, in my example, the United States reacting the same way that the Brits reacted back in the days, namely, no, 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 you're still our inhabitants, and if necessary, we're going to use force to subject you to our authority, which then led, of course, to the, the wars of liberation, which the British lost, and then the United States could get gets, uh, established. Or will the United States, or for that matter, any other country, say, you know, 
you're good to go, you're on your own now, create your own social and legal construct, which we may call a state or a country or an extraterrestrial country or whatever. You are no longer subject to the United States, but then don't come whining to us if something goes wrong, right? You're on your own. That, that is sort of the two approaches. And of course, that will usually interfere with the idea of the home country uh, still wanting to claim that part. Uh, now, different countries may react differently. I could imagine that if the Chinese go there, and I, you know, I expect that they probably might be there in droves before the Americans uh, would be there or any other country. In China, it's by definition all a state or an enterprise. So the Chinese people who will be sent there, I'm not sure that the Chinese government 20 or 30 years from now would be willing to say, okay, you're on your own now. No, they will probably you know tend to think that this is an extension of china as it is but that's of course i'm i'm as you as you see i'm usually hypothesizing and ex, ex, extrapolating historical developments into the future and nobody really knows that's what we're doing we're talking space law right that's that's what yeah. lawyers do especially in space so speaking of asteroid mining i know there's been a little bit of controversy here essentially most countries aren't of the opinion you can take stuff and own it. The U.S. is like, go for it, take whatever you want. Can you dive a little bit deeper into asteroid mining, why it's yeah. important and space law side? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the problem is, and, and we talked about this earlier, that the Outer Space Treaty in, in a number of respects, you know, uh, is outdated in the sense that it didn't foresee a number of, of developments. This is one example there, one other example there was, because in 1967, Nobody seriously thought it would be of interest to try and, and commercially mine the moon or asteroids, which, by the way, legally speaking, I know that, uh, you know, from a physical perspective, they're totally different. But legally speaking, they're in the same basket, so, so we can treat them as one and the same for legal purposes. So nobody in the 60s thought that, that mining those celestial bodies would make any sense. Um, so there is no clause in the Outer Space Treaty which says something specific about it. The clause, the clause coming closest to being relevant, and I'm sorry for that complex formulation, is the same clause which prohibits colonization. Because the way I usually frame it is that this creates a kind of a global commons, but it doesn't say anything about how to treat resources in that commons. And that's where divine uh, opinions diverge. You see, on the one hand, uh, the approach which is most vocally supported, I should say, by, by Russia, which says that if outer space is a global commons, if it belongs to all states, You there, Franz? Hello, are you there? Yeah, it dropped out for a sec. I lost you. Yeah, it cut out. Can you uh, can you hear me now? Hello. Yeah, Matt? can you hear me? Can you hear me? I uh, Are you coming through very? I have a bit of sound, but that's it. Try, uh, try turning. Do you have headphones? Yeah. Try plugging those in and see if it changes anything. Okay. That's weird. Yeah, it certainly kicked. I mean, I had a few. Now I hear you well, I should say, but. Okay. I had a few. Can you talk to me? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah. Very good. Perfect. So, yeah, Gaspar, just cut this part out of the of the podcast and edit it together to sound nice. Okay, I'm trying to because my it says uh, preferences submitted. Now you're taking care of business. No, this is not what I want. I can go back to Zoom right now, can I? Yeah, there I see you as well. Okay. So, um, where were we? Um, we on space mining. mining. Yeah, asteroid mining. So do you want me to s simply start asking, uh, answering the question again? You can do that and unless there's a spot where you think you could make it cut in together and make sense. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I thought as far as I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I know I'm rather wordy, but there's a lot of explanation to do. So uh, 
you know. You're a lawyer. You've got to be a little wordy, right? There you go. Thank you very much for your understanding. <laughs> okay. Um, as for space mining, that is another example of why the Outer Space Treaty um, is in some respects outdated or not, let me put it slightly differently, not sufficiently tailored for these times. Because in, back in the 60s when it was concluded, nobody reasonably thought that the moon or, or asteroids um, would be subject to something like space mining. And, and by the way, I know that physically speaking, they are totally different, a totally different order, but the moon and asteroids in a legal sense are all in the same basket. So we can treat them as they are the same, as if they're the same kind of thing. And again, the 1967 treaty did not address that. The only thing it did was create this absence of territorial sovereignty. And that allows for two different, basically for two different interpretations. One line of interpretation, which is most vocally defended by, by the Russians, I should say, is the argument that because outer space belongs to everyone, it is, it is not a single state territory, that also means that the resources in outer space should be somehow shared by all states. That there should be an international regime, one way or another, determining who under what circumstances might actually be allowed to go there and mine those resources. So an international heavy regime, which is of course also from an economic perspective, something which may stifle development because if you're spending or interested in spending billions and going there, you expect that you can generate, earn all the revenues. And if there is some heavyweight international system uh, taking away part of your control, you might not like it in the first place. So that's why the United States in particular, and some other countries as well, have taken the opposite stance and argued, well, this is basically something like a global commons. So while no one can reserve the global commons or call it part of the national territory and exclusively exercise control and power over it, all states are in principle entitled to benefit from it or allow their private sector to benefit from it as long as they or the private sector complies with international uh, law that is applicable. So these are the two positions. To give a little bit more of an illustration, the Russian position basically is similar to, uh, to uh, what happens currently with the regard to the ocean floor where you have a legal regime which has an international licensing authority. So any company from anywhere in the world needs an international license uh, before he or she can actually start harvesting whatever resources they're looking for in the ocean floor. Um, the United States is not a party to that, as one of the few countries, I should say, um, partly because it is fundamentally against this idea that there should be an international uh, community, international organization, institution, determining whether a private company can work there. So the opposite illustration, which is the one that the United States, and I should add Luxembourg, because Luxembourg has made a law roughly similar to the US one, uh, and some others as well are upholding and saying, well, no, we can treat outer space like the high seas, which is another global cause. Uh, the high seas is again not subject, by definition, not subject to territorial jurisdiction. No single state can say this part of the high seas is mine and everybody else stays out and I'm the only one who can determine who is entitled to pick the fish there. No, that is not possible. But it is possible, of course, for fishermen from every nation in particular, in, in, you know, whatsoever, to go there to a piece of the high seas, take the fish, you know, grab it out of the water, and then make a living in doing so. And that's obviously what has happened over hundreds, if not thousands of years. So that is the parallel that the United States sees. And they say, well, as long as these fishing companies comply with the laws, in that case, the laws of the sea, uh, about overfishing, about prohibition on whaling and, and catching dolphins and pollution, as long as they comply with this set of international rules, they're good to go and they can make their money. And that's the... That's the regime that they would also like to see for space mining. Now, because of the political divergence and the fact that Russians and some others do not agree with that, there is now a political discussion going on in the international context, which, you know, which way this ultimately should end up to. And hopefully they will come to some sort of an agreement because the worst of all situations is that you have a number of states saying private operators, well, as far as we are concerned, you're good to go, you know, 
do your best, try to make money. And then another set of countries saying, this is illegal, uh, whatever they bring back, we treat that just like blood diamonds, right? Uh, illegal uh, illegal uh, goods, not, uh, you know, not subject to trade. If they fall in our hands, we will seize them. If we are able to lay our hands on those who try to sell them, we will prosecute them in court. That's not a very nice situation, you know? so we should, in the political discussion, hopefully be able to build a more detailed, clear, transparent, et cetera, et cetera, legal regime to allow that to happen. From your perspective, let's say we put you in a position no lawyer wants to be, where you have to actually pick an outcome. What would you bet your money on in terms of where we end up with regulations around this? What type of consensus the world comes to, if any? I, I would pet, put my money, but not too much, as you can imagine, on an outcome which would favor the U.S. approach. Um, not by way of an internationally agreed treaty, because I think that puts the issues too, too, too clearly, too, if you will, too confrontingly, too provocatively on the table for those countries who have a big problem with that. Uh, even though, as a lawyer, I would prefer a treaty text, because then you have a very you know, very precise black and white letter law rules to, to look to, even if there might be interpretation problems. But what I think will happen is that more and more countries will realize that the approach of the United States and Luxembourg is reasonable as long as they feel um, convinced that these authorities in, in licensing such private activities will indeed duly take the safety and the environmental concerns and scientific concerns, et cetera, et cetera, into, in, 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 into consideration. They will think that that is the more logical approach and will either silently accept it or probably if they're a little bit more forward looking like Luxembourg was, simply think, well, you know, we have to jump the bandwagon anyway. So let's be one of the first to jump the bandwagon because then we're always also most likely to, to benefit. And I see some movement towards the latter. So again, going back to your original question, I think the, the, the best chance of what's, go, or what's going to happen is that 10 years from now, we will see a general acceptance, basically, of the U.S. approach with perhaps some additional international agreements or standards on how to behave when you are actually mining an asteroid. So speaking of behavior, let's talk space junk, debris, and possible Kent Kessler situation. We, there's a lot of satellites up there now, and I hear it's getting quite cluttered. Well, where are we at in terms of some type of international consensus on what to do to make sure we don't become landlocked? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, there are movements in the right direction. The, the big question is whether they are quick, you know, whether they will result in, 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 you know, in something which really works quick enough before the Kessler effect or the Kessler syndrome actually has resulted in, as you say, uh, too much risk to do anything in space. But since there are enormous interests at stake, you know, not just civil and commercial, but also military, I mean, space debris doesn't discriminate. If something is floating around, it could hit a US uh, reconnaissance satellite or a targeting satellite or whatever military satellites the US and other countries have in space as well. So everyone, in particular the big space countries, have a major interest in trying to preclude this from happening. And that, of course, from a political perspective, gives me some hope that it might be possible to do something about it. Now, having said that, it's obviously not an easy thing. What, when I said developments are there, what I see happening is that in this licensing process of private operators, which we spoke about before, the US, the United Kingdom, and France, as the most outstanding examples, are, I dare say, are already imposing guidelines, which used to be voluntary guidelines on the international level, but they are imposing them in the licensing on the operator. So, for example, if in the United States you want to get a license to have your satellite launched, you need to show that you have taken a number of measures minimizing, of course, not nullifying, that's not possible. The only way you cannot create more space to be is by not launching anything, but at least minimalizing. The chance, minimizing the chance that new space debris will happen. Um, that is a great development because if everyone starts doing that, we will soon be in an area 
where uh, at least the generation of new space debris will be minimized. Now, of course, we have to see the other uh, side of it. These uh, requirements cost money. Uh, for example, one of the requirements that you see more and more is that uh, satellites, when they are at the end of their projected lifetime, should lose the uh, use the remaining bit of fuel to boost the satellite into a graveyard or orbit, or if they are flying in a low Earth orbit, to be orbited so that the atmosphere will do the dirty work and burn it up, so that there is no risk of space to be floating around without any control. But that costs money. Uh, on average, three months of fuel. So by doing, by imposing these requirements of all satellite operators, you're basically telling them, uh, without any benefit directly to yourself, you will lose three months of potential income from your customers because your satellite is supposed to be moved out of orbit three months before. And of course, these are all statistical calculations, but still, it, it gives you an idea. So there is a development, but in order to convince everyone, there still needs a lot to be done because no country is really keen on disadvantaging their own private sector by imposing higher obligations than other countries do. And you see the same thing in general in the environment. And then there's the other issue that this only helps probably, uh, uh, you know, uh, minimize the chance of new space to be being shot into outer space. But we still have the problem of all the space debris which is already there. Where the Kessler syndrome, if it works out the way that some people project, and there's still a lot of discussion, I understand. I'm not a physicist, of course, but I understand there's still a lot of discussion on that. But if it turns out, the way people think it turns out, you don't need to launch anything right now and still have a cluttered outer space 10 years from now because of what's going on with pieces of debris which fragment because they start hitting each other already. So the next thing we need to do is think about taking out pieces of space debris and really cleaning up. And again, ultimately, it's a matter of money. Already 20 years ago, the University of Arizona had developed a kind of a vacuum cleaner for low Earth orbits. Uh, it never went beyond the drawing board, but basically people whom I spoke to said, well, this should be technically feasible. But, of course, you talk about launching something in outer space, a vacuum cleaner, which you know, gets you immediately to tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of launching cost, and you don't get any revenue because nobody pays for you to get the stuff down. So, while the technology is there, and even the lawyers could help drafting requirements to clean up your own mess, if the states and the operators, because of the costs involved, are not willing to do that, that will be a big issue. So if you want me to be a little bit cynical as a lawyer, we really have to wait for the first multi-million dollar satellite to be incapacitated by a piece of space debris before everybody wakes up and say, well, maybe it's better to pay a few million dollars at the outset, contribute that to a giant cleaning operation, then run the risk that we lose a $200 million satellite. But that's, you know, that, that's, that's the way humanity works. You only close the door of the barn after the horse has escaped. Yeah, so, we'll, we'll go ahead. No, I was going to say the same thing. You only start taxing, uh, taxing gasoline once you discover that vehicle emissions are ruining the world. But right. if you have that tax, then you have the money at least internationally to right. fix the problem. Right. It's interesting. So Mr. Trump announces his space force. Uh, where are we headed in terms of the military in space? And when would you predict, if you had to, our first Star Wars, so to speak? Uh, well, this is worrying. Let, let's put it uh, fair and simple. It is not necessarily uh, the case that this is due to this uh, Space Force initiative, because obviously uh, military use of outer space is not limited to U.S. military use. Uh, and the Russians and the Chinese, to name the two most powerful antagonists in space of the United States, have, of course, their own space force. Um, I don't know enough of the developments in that area to, to consider whether, you know, uh, the, the discussions in the United States on the space force are a reaction to, uh, to what the Chinese and the Russians are doing, because if they are boosting their, uh, their space forces then, uh, you know, it is basically their responsibility to may have maybe have started another arms race in outer space. If, on the contrary, uh, the U.S. initiative would result 
in the first escalation beyond the situation that we've had for decades of years, then the United States might be found guilty of escalating and risking a lot. Now, having said that, to me, it still is not clear what the Space Force is going to look like. You know, uh, on, on, on the low end of the scale, it is just an internal reorganization of the U.S. Armed Forces, the space the, the, all the space, military space activities so far are part of the Air Force, just like the Air Force until the end of the Second World War was part of the Army. So that you just separate those forces, create a separate force, separate budgets, buildings, careers, etc., etc., as such is not a big deal and maybe actually advantageous because it perhaps allows more focused thinking on defending the military interests of the United States in space. So that is not only perfectly allowable, it might even be a good thing because it creates some more visibility. But as you move on towards the other end of the scale, things become more worrisome. Uh, we talked already about, you know, if he's going to spend more money in space, if, if the administration as a result of the space force thing is going to spend more money in space, that might either be a valid reaction to what the Russians and the Chinese are already doing, or it might be a not so valid uh, effort to, you know, to take the Russians and the Chinese by surprise and uh, thereby create an arms race. So that already depends a little bit upon your judgment of, of, of what's going on in the real world. Now, even more worrisome if, and you never know, unfortunately, with your current uh, president, what he might be thinking and what he means with what he tweets, what he tweets and what the results will be. But if he really thinks about putting American soldiers in outer space, uh, not only is that prohibited, uh, it of course raises the stakes by so much. And actually, I think that military speaking, it doesn't make sense at all either. I mean, if you really want to do bad things to your enemy in outer space, it's 100 times as cheap and 10 times as efficient not to do it by putting men, humans there, the, the armed soldier with his rifle or whatever the space component is there, but to, to use cyber uh, hacking and, 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 you know, just kill satellites by taking over control, just like uh, the U.S. has done a couple of times with, with uh, nuclear centrifuges in Iran, uh, the Stuxnet thing. So from a military perspective, I don't think it makes sense. So I hope that other people, including the military uh, leadership in, in, in the country, would, as soon as this would become a serious plan, would say, you know, it doesn't make military sense. It costs much more than, than it needs to. It doesn't help us. And on the contrary, politically speaking, of course, it allows our opponents to say, you know, this, those are the bad Americans again. See, they really want to colonize outer space. They're actually sending soldiers out there to occupy it. So from all perspectives, it is not good. It is illegal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, another worrisome extreme on the other end of the scale is if the reference to a space force would mean actually putting weapons, in particular nuclear weapons of mass destruction in outer space or oh also somebody. Yeah, that's, you know, I mean, politically speaking, the worst that you can think about, I don't know whether it makes military sense either, but it certainly is in violation of the treaties as they stand because they are very clear on nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, where we end on this scale, I hope, you know, towards the end with which I started out with, because that's rather innocent, but you never know. Let's get to an even more sketchy subject. So I had a, I had one of the designers that was working on, I want to say it was Mars One, but he was working on habitats for space. Right. And one of the one of the things that they brought up was, well, what happens when you have humanity living in a semi-communist, socialist type environment? They're living in a space station where every person matters a lot and consumes a lot of resources. When is it time to kick the lazy guy out of the out of the uh, cube so to speak when do you cut off their oxygen has, has there been any type of conversations or thoughts around that from a law perspective of when is it murder and when is it self-defense uh not to that very specific uh last part of your hypothesis hypothetical scenario but the first part absolutely i actually last october uh, there was a, a seminar organized uh, at the Harvard Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, which involved not only, you know, the sort of the standard people, the astrophysicists and, uh, uh, and the commercial guys, because it was co-organized by the 
uh, astrophysical department and the Harvard School of Business Management, um, School of Business. Uh, but it also included myself as a lawyer, and it included a few sociologists who started discussing this idea, okay, you know, what, how can we ensure that uh, our political slash humanitarian values like democracy, uh, rule of law, uh, equality of gender, etc., etc., or basic equality of, of humans, you know, that that will also develop in a context where, as you sort of in a somewhat hidden way point out, where it would make perhaps too much sense to have a very hierarchical and strict system, whether it's communist or an authoritarian dictatorship, where one guy at the top decides all, um, which, which certainly in the initial phases um, might be necessary for survival. You cannot have in critical situations, perhaps, that everybody, everybody starts a democratic discussion process, which may require, you know, three months before a decision will be made, it may require someone on the spot overruling, you know, potential opposition saying, well, this is the only way we can survive as a species. So how to deal with that? Well, we, I can already unfortunately say that we haven't come up with the answers yet, but the discussions are taking place. Eh? How do you guarantee that, um, that indeed um, the, the incredibly dangerous environment where you start with, and certainly in the early days or years when you you're really pioneers, you have no idea what can go wrong. So you cannot have the luxury in a sense of, of, of what we are used to in democratic society with, you know, with this, uh, possibilities to appeal against independent uh, or for, before independent authorities and, and judges and things like that. Um, how do you make sure that as quickly as possible that evolves into what we, at least in, in, in our democratic societies, see as, as core values of, of humanity. Um, the hope is, I think that is sort of a very high level abstract summary of the discussion at the Harvard seminar, is that we move quickly enough to so many establishments that we see, you know, uh, people being able to make the choice of what they prefer. If they, if they are, you know, if they prefer to have a very clear cut uh, autarchical hierarchy, they can move to a station which operates like China. If they prefer to have an open society with all the risks that that entails for individual humans, uh, they may move to a settlement that is more open. That, that is, but well, I'm already going out on a limb, you know, and trying to summarize the thinking, but we're just really just starting to think about these issues. But they're, of course, immensely fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. And even all of those only come about once we have essentially ubiquitous oxygen, which we won't have initially. If Johnny's right. stealing right. Jenny's oxygen, then eventually you've got a problem. Right. And it's a matter of that life and death, right? I mean, it's not like if here you steal something, you know, you can still survive and you probably have a possibility to go to the police and, and blah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't work in outer space. Certainly, if you talk about small communities uh, which have to every day defend their life because you know just one leak in the whole tent and everybody's dead you know without too much exaggeration so the the, the mere fact that opinions may diverge which is considered a key baseline requirement for democratic society for the development of human thinking and the argument of open market of ideas all that thinking Maybe you cannot necessarily afford that in all circumstances in this particular environment, certainly not in the beginning. But of course, as we grow, as, and, and I mean, maybe it's comparable to the development of humanity as a whole. Obviously, back in the old days, you had one guy, usually it was a guy on top of the club, who had authority of life and death over the rest. That's how society started to be organized throughout human history. Now, we have advanced in most cases uh, for a thousand years, uh, so we've moved on. Hopefully that will happen in outer space, but who knows, you know? Then again, we might be coming back with Bezos taking over the world. So <laughs> that's, another risk. Yeah, yeah. that's another one, transitioning yeah. a little bit. Right. What, what technology, not necessarily what we've been talking about, but just in general, are you most excited about today and why? In terms of space? In terms of anything. 
Uh, well, I, I'll limit myself to space because that's the, 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 the area of technology I at least I know something about because of my constant interaction with that world for, for, for more than 30 years. I think the most important and, and, and sensational development is going to take place in the transportation field. Because once you are basing yourself on the baseline assumption that humanity's entry into outer space is a good thing. And that, you know, people, there, not everyone agrees to that. There are people who say, well, it's all uh, space flight is, is a waste of money. Uh, you know, it's just allowing some two lucky people to get out there and we can use those billions much more efficiently for solving the major problems that we have on Earth. But once you say, okay, even given all that, it's a good thing, or maybe it's an inevitable thing, and that people say, well, man cannot do anything else than try to explore, that's part of its foundational nature. Once you accept that as a good thing, and you accept that uh, there might be certain risks of you know, negative consequences about everything that humans can do, which you try to curb by law, but the overall balance is hopefully still positive, then the thing that we need is cheaper access to space. Uh, currently, it costs about 11,000 pounds per kilogram to, to, to get something into outer space. Now, that's outrageous in terms of, of, of costs. So if you really want to be able to, for example, to export much of our wasteful energy generation into outer space, and there are some spectacular plans for that, we first need to get the cost of getting something out there down. And uh, so, and, and I do see, uh, thanks partly to space tourism, I do see movements in that direction going on. So the, the space tourist operators, they obviously uh, are still in the beginning of their trade. Uh, we still have to see how successful they're going to be. But they, by nature, will have to develop much, uh, much more lenient space operations in terms of the energy of getting there than the traditional space agencies which were used to working with bulk budget. I mean, if you see the money thrown at NASA in the 60s and 70s, that's astonishing, that's amazing, it's flabbergasted. And it, by the way, they, those levels have never been uh, reached ever since because obviously that took place in the Cold War context and all of that. Um, but anyway, going back to my original point, I think the launch technology, the, 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 the search, for new ways of using energy and then in addition green energy because of course also the space industry is subject to a lot of scrutiny by the green sides of society who don't want all these exhaust flames and stuff like that which is also fossil fuels by and large uh, to move towards towards new kinds of, i find that fascinating and also crucial if you you know if you want to put a big word on it crucial for the survival of mankind if, uh, once you come to the conclusion and again you can argue about that but that's <laughs> barely the earth, the earth is not the only uh, that the earth should not be the only egg in our basket that we should you know have different places so that if something really bad happens to the earth we have an alternative as mankind then bringing down the cost of going into outer space by developing new launch technologies is key and again i see interesting things happening there yeah elon's been doing a good job as well what do you think Let's make it a two-part question. Life in space, and then if we do discover, more likely when we do discover life in space, legal ramifications. What's considered life? How do we think about disturbing um, planets? Will we have some type of Star Trek, let's not touch it perspective? Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned that because obviously while that has been generally viewed as a lot of science fiction and, 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 and you know, visionary stuff, not for the ordinary lawyer, we have had some discussions on that. Um, and we should go back actually to the realization that law is basically there to uh, regulate human interactions and human actions. So if we find non-human life out there, how do we deal with that? Well, how does the law deal with it? How can the law deal with that? And then you have to, I think, make a very rough threefold division. What type of life are we talking about? The, the, the first category, is life which is far less intelligent than us. So we're talking about microbes or, or uh, you know, things like that. Um, and then obviously we as humans can impose, can use the law to handle them as we see fit. 
just as we do animals today, you know, even much more intelligent animals than microbia and algae and stuff like that, right? We have laws prohibiting the maltreatment of animals, etc., etc. Now, these animals themselves cannot defend them in court. We have to have humans step up for them. But that is a possibility. Um, I don't think that's the biggest problem. Uh, we actually have already some law or, or, or pre-law in place. There are already planetary guidelines developed by the scientists. When you go to an, a foreign planet, you need to sterilize your, uh, your spacecraft to a certain extent, to, to a very great extent actually, to preclude or to minimize again. You can never completely get preclude, but at least to minimize the chances that you are introducing earth bacteria in an environment which is not able to handle them and thereby maybe kill whatever life might be there. So there are, there are already rules for that. Well, that's the easy part. It becomes already more difficult if we encounter a uh, life outside of Earth, which is roughly uh, you know, at the level of our intelligence. If that is the case, they will probably have their own system, their own social system of interaction, which is something similar to what we call law, but substantively it may be totally different. Um, but and they will not be happy to give it up just because we think our legal system is better and should rule them as well as our interaction between with them and neither are we willing I'm assuming to give up our laws just because there might be some alien species who think they know it better as to how humans should interact so you get then two sort of communities or, or, or uh, populations or whatever you want name you want to give to it who then have to sort of negotiate and find out a meta law to act between the two, which is essentially what we've seen happening on the earth as well, where all laws started on the national level. And then at a certain time, the Brits and the French started trading with each other, living with each other, marrying each other, and had to find a way to address these international problems, in particular between the two countries. That's where international law comes. So, and the most interesting part, but also the most frightening part, is of course the third category, when life out there is much more intelligent than us. Um, and this, you know, you see in people who look for life in outer space, some people adhere to what we call the zoo hypothesis. And in this hypothesis, we are the animals, meaning that there have been already far smarter uh, life in outer space, which has discovered us, hasn't, you know, uh, shown themselves to us but they're looking at us like we look at, at uh, animals in a zoo cage who are basically unaware of us you know so well then we can just devise whatever law we want <laughs> we've got to be subject to their mercy whether it you know whether it works whether we are even allowed to apply that law between ourselves so that is that is sort of the if you want to address these issues that's sort of where you start but it's not more than a start in case you guys are wondering, all of that's true, even if we're living in a simulation. <laughs> so it's, uh, there, there's so many implications of, of all of this. I want to jump into the Patreon-only bonus question. So are you ready, Franz? Yeah. And for listeners, if you haven't supported the podcast, disruptors.fm slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We have a three or four set of rapid-fire questions. We ask every guest things we would think would be super valuable for you guys. And I'll be blatantly honest, this is a way for us to monetize without having to try to sell you guys garbage. We need to make this sustainable because getting <laughs> off people like Franz is tough. So let's do it. Okay, Franz, my first question for you. I want a big, contrarian, bold advice, something that most people around you don't believe, a 10-year prediction. What would it be? It can be about anything. 10 years from now, we will have thousands of people flying in outer space. For the fun of it, but also uh, commuting from New York to Tokyo in two hours instead of 12. Oh, so you're a, you're a big proponent of Elon's um, up and back system that he proposed? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's and a, again, it's, it's a prediction. Eh? And the predictions are easy, except if they're about the future. So don't, don't hold me to my word 10 years from now. <laughs> yeah, you, usually people, people go with a 20 to 30 year once because by then they'll be retired or totally different. So <laughs> I should have done that stupid. No worries. What's the best advice you ever got and why? Um, ooh, that, that's a difficult one. 
uh, stay true to yourself, but, does, but don't let that get in the way to, to making a better self. Um, in other words, you should not artificially try to become someone else, but you should also not um, be uh, complacent with what you are, you know, and dispose of any criticism and saying, well, you know, this is who I am, shut the F up and, and I'll continue. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the middle of the road, right? You have to be always thinking about um, possibilities, options, scenarios, uh, tools that other people can help you with, which you never thought about that before. And if you feel they are helpful and if they don't are too far away from your core identity, use them and do take some trouble to, to, uh, to become better at using them. You can't be someone else because everybody else is already taken. And if someone's there giving you, you life advice, if they're not further along on that life path that you want to be on, it's probably not incredibly relevant. So th those go. would be the two that I would add on top of that. If, okay. you were, if you were young today, 18 to 20-ish, what would you do? What would you pursue and why? Uh, I'd probably spend more time on making music. I mean, I'm, I, I did play the violin for eight years when I was a kid, but then for a number of reasons stopped doing that. Uh, partly because I got more attracted to, to, to modern music, rock, uh, symphonic rock in particular. And one of the things that I probably regret most, if you want to put it in those negative terms, is that I've never taken the time, found the time to pick that up again and play the guitar or something like that. But, uh, but that's, that's not obviously not something professional, right? But I'm going to give you a challenge anyways. By the end of the week, I want you to have picked up and played a guitar or a violin. It doesn't have to be for very long. <laughs> you can walk into some shop and try it out. But that's our, that's our disruptors challenge for you. <laughs> okay, I got it. And last one. What type of technology or trend worries you the most and why? Cyber. Cyber technology. Because of the impossibility of, uh, of, of tracking... The bad guys. I mean, there's a whole discussion going on, and of course, there's a balance there as well. But uh, the fact that this technology is able to underpin, undermine any any form of democratic control worries me most. And it goes in comparison with the political naivete that many people have. You know, when people started the internet, the idea was the country. This is finally full democracy, right? Everybody who uh, you know, has just a limited knowledge of the technology of going on to the internet, can now post their meaning, can get, engage in free and discuss, uh, welcome discussions. But we sadly see it turn the other way, that uh, on the one hand, the big companies, and on the other hand, all the distractors and the news fakers and the fake news and stuff like that, are make it, making it impossible to control what's going on there. And in, in, perhaps even more important, are impossible for normal people to find out what the real truth is. And that is, I think, not just a technological danger, but a danger to our whole society as it is. I would definitely agree. We're going to jump back to the interview now, guys. So that would be, that would be the, the last area that I want to take this is with, uh, with the troubling trends. I know the EU is doing they're doing as good a job as they can. I want to say some of the regulations have been a little poorly worded and set up and has led to those little banners where we all kind of click, yeah, okay, next, take me to the actual website. But, but how do you see this playing out as we do kind of have a splintering of the internet? Oh, that is very difficult to judge. I, I, I think I see some positive movements um, in the sense that there are some internet providers who, who are really fair and transparent and open in their privacy uh, considerations but I also I, we also must be realistic in the sense that it, it's it's uh, puts a burden on the business model because there's no question that the business model of using that information which Facebook and Google and Amazon have become such powerful players uh, having developed that is is based upon a tremendous value of information and and if you are voluntarily you know Getting rid of that, it means that the alternative systems are just um, used by a few diehards who are very principled in their approach, 
and who are willing to forego an enormous amount of possible and sometimes pos and often positive uh, effects. You know, if you if you start being on Facebook, you must be rather principled in order to do that because it means that you know eighty percent of the people you normally interact with you will not be able to use their uh, their normal conduit for contacting you apart from the the, the, the person to person you meet on it just because that is Facebook and and uh, you know you sacrifice so much uh, in direct terms by by you know stepping out of that which of course is still possible that so far the operators which have which are really playing a fair game and uh, you know are, are, are willing to honor privacy rights and things like that simply are niche operators so far and that's why I think you need a, f a way to find but that's easier said than done, of course. We need a way to find uh, democratic control over those over those operators in order to simply require them to stick to certain rules and be able to enforce them. Uh, you know, just like we have standards for what a, a, a butcher can sell now, uh, which are imposed by government, just because a butcher certifying its own meat is not a good thing. Now the problem with uh, with meat is that you can find out, or the good thing about meat is that you can find it pretty quickly if the meat is bad, you know, you get ill or, or it tastes bad or whatever. And most people can find that out pretty quickly. The problem with technology is that it's so incredibly complicated that there are only a few people who can actually seriously control that they are that there are no back doors through which they can get into your privacy again. Um, and it's not and, that you end up, oh, go ahead. And, and that's, you know, and that's not just limited to cyber, but you see it with the, with the Volkswagen scandal. You see it with the current uh, Boeing Max scandal, where it is the butcher certifying their own meat. Why? Because the FAA simply doesn't have the required technical capacity to really critically double check that everything that Boeing claims about the safety of that aircraft is true. You know, so they leave it they call it self-regulation which is to me a kind of a, an internal paradox um, but that's what it is and and there are always you know the, again the butcher is certifying its own meat do you think he's completely neutral does he do, do you think that he's going as far as he should go to make sure that his meat is is okay so and and that applies to the internet as well and it's so much more dangerous when the butcher thinks he's doing the right thing by trying to make sure that people are able to access the meat. I want to make it cheaper, easier, faster for the poor people around the there world to get access. But suddenly we find out, wait, there was this tiny little trace right. thing. When right. you've eaten right. enough of it, it's not like one person ends up on the toilet. Everyone's shitting themselves and society's falling apart. Right. <laughs> and that's, that's what we've got with Zuckerberg and Google right now. They're yeah. trying to save the world and tearing it apart in a lot of ways. This has been a, this has been a fun, interesting one. We've been all around the cosmos at this point, Franz. Right. I got one last question before you tell people where to find you. And that's, if you had a quote, a call to action, something that you wanted to leave listeners with, what it would it be and why? Uh, think for yourself. I mean, it's, it's probably, probably an open door, but also in space, uh, you have to be uh, even though it's space is it's not nearly as technical perhaps as cyber, which we just spoke about, but there is a lot of stuff going on which is difficult to uh, to comprehend for a normal being, if you, even if you consider yourself uh, fairly intelligent. But there is always a need to think for yourself and to to start, you know, to um, to be critical about where something doesn't quite fit in where somebody states the one thing and then the next sentence states something which somehow doesn't comply and it doesn't mean that he's wrong or that you are certainly latching onto something important but don't be afraid then to ask why you know point to the dis dis discretion uh, to, to the disruption and and try to find out more about it and uh, it, to a certain extent the only there are no stupid questions, or let me put it differently, the only questions that are stupid are the ones that have already been answered before, but you were not listening. You know what I'm saying? So um, don't be afraid to ask questions to make sure that you understand it as good as humanly possible. And, and always keep on the lookout for contrary uh, facts, for contrary opinions, to make sure that you really 
consider both sides, do you think? Consider both sides, spoken like a true lawyer. Thanks for coming <laughs> on today, Franz. Where's the best place for people to find more about you, your work, your TED Talk, all the good stuff? Yeah, well, the easiest one, I guess, is my website at University of Nebraska, Lincoln, which is where I'm working. Um, if you go to faculty directory, uh, and the faculty, I have my own page under my name, Franz von der Bank. And if you click on, you can find my, uh, the publications of which I'm most proud, the TED Talks and the Pink Talks and the TV interviews of which I'm most proud. So you usually find a link through to the, uh, to the relevant YouTube or wherever the video is stored. Sometimes we haven't stored, our, stored it ourselves. And for those of you who are interested in my commercial, uh, commercial part of my work, because I also have my own consultancy, also the UNL website provides a link to Black Holes, which is my consultancy, where you can find a lot of information of the projects that I've been working on over the last couple of decades. Be very careful with lawyers. That bill can become a black hole that pulls out, sucks everything in with the gravity of its mass. It's, I imagine it's not as bad, uh, and it's not as bad, at least in the industry you're in. But uh, it's been awesome having you on, Franz. Thanks, thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure. Thank you. And thanks for tuning in, guys. If you've liked this, you know what to do. We'll have links and everything for Franz's work in the show notes, disruptors.fm. And consider sharing the podcast with a friend iTunes, Stitcher, whatever it is, if you leave a review, help us grow the audience so that we can get more awesome guests. Cheers. Awesome, that was good. Yeah, I hope it was to your liking. <laughs>